4, verse 10, if you have that, say amen. Wow. Give me another second or two. It's over toward the back of part of the Old Testament. If you're in Genesis, if you're in Revelation, you're in the wrong direction. Chapter 4, verse 10. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven. They are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro throughout, through the whole earth. I want that first phrase in particular. God is asking a rhetorical question, and it's not so rhetorical in this house today, but he asked this question, for who hath despised the day of small things? And in context, he's asking who hath despised the day of small beginnings, small beginnings. It doesn't always start out the way that you want it to end it starts out a lot of times very small. If we're not careful, we won't recognize it. Brother Aaron, lead us in prayer. Master, Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity to hear the word today. We ask you, Lord, to bless our pastor as he brings forth the word. Bless our ears to hear as he preaches. We give the praise and honor of the glory of God that's been brought to this altar. In Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Amen. May we see him in the presence of the Lord. I personally love technology. I think it's God's gift to the church. I'm able to reach millions and millions of people while I'm talking to maybe a handful here. It's a, it's a part of technology. It's just going to be, as the days go, as time goes, it's just going to become more and more intricate, more amazing. But it's created a particular attitude of people. It's created a, a minute man religion. We want everything and we want it now. But it's not, it's, 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 it's everywhere. It's in every facet, every walk of life. It's, it's on the job site, it's in the college, it's in academia, it's at the church. And I just happen to be at church today so I may focus in that area. And I've seen a lot of times a young man or a young lady have some passion Oh, they get saved and maybe can quote three or four verses and you know how it is. Mama and daddy starts telling them that they're called to preach and yeah. uncles and everybody's got them going to go to seminar and, you know, and, and all of that and the next thing you know this, this, this person who has only been saved about 18 seconds has got a microphone in their hand and they're trying to preach a book that they've never read. I'm just telling you from experience, I'm talking to you from 20 years of ministry, I have seen young men, young ladies thrown into the machine and it chews them up and spits them out. And everyone says, I don't understand, they, they look so good, they had potential, they, they were gifted, and all of that's true, they, they did have potential, they did have gifts, but there are some things that you can only preach after you've lived it. Yeah. You need to understand today that with passion comes pain. I say this a lot, and, and I hear some of you saying it some now, but it's true, and I, I believe it. You, you don't go to bed a blunder and wake up a wonder. No, and it just doesn't happen that way. It doesn't happen that way. I'm not telling you that when you get saved and your feet hit the floor that you shouldn't be telling people about Jesus. You should. Right. You should. But it's a dangerous thing for us to launch out into something before we are prepared. We don't like preparation. We want the glory. We want the glamour. But then we have to come to the realization that there is some stuff that's going to happen in between those points. We stand on this mountaintop. We see another mountaintop. And we say, I want that mountaintop. But we don't want to go down through the valley. We don't want to go through what is necessary to get over there. And so we stand on this mountaintop and we spend most of our life trying to figure out how we can translate ourselves or, or, or some type of just, uh, you know, move from here to there without any uh, movement, without taking a step. And it's, you know, it's like the old philosopher said, the old Chinese philosopher, he said that the journey of a thousand miles starts with one step. One step. You know, you know, we have to prepare for some things. You have to be ready to go through some things. It is necessary. Pain is a part of the process. 
They, they say, you know, with no pain, no gain. There's a reason they say that. You know, the bodybuilder, the man or woman who is lifting weights, there must be a breaking down of the muscle. There must be a breaking down. That's the reason it hurts. That's the reason there's pain. But in the breaking of those muscles and busting of the, uh, of the, the vessels and however that works, it rebuilds itself and it rebuilds itself stronger. I don't understand how we can come to church and expect to, to have all of our dreams and all of our ambitions and everything that we have worked really hard for years and years and years to destroy. We expect that God is going to wave a wand over top of us and by some magical incantation. Everything that we have spent 30 years destroying, we want him to fix it just like that. But there are some things that you're going to have to wake up in the morning, put your boots on and put, put your, uh, comb your hair and you're going to have to face it. You're going to have to learn to cope with some things. There's some things that you're going to have to learn doesn't go away immediately. And somebody said, well, what am I going to do, Pastor? You know, I thought that if I served the Lord, then all of this stuff is going to go away. I said, well, you should have never thought that in the first place. You should have served God because God is good. You should have served the Lord because Jesus died for you. You didn't need any other reason. I'm not serving him so I can get rich, so I can have money, so I can have friends, so I can have a church, so I can have... No, 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 no. I'm serving him because about 2,000 years ago, God hung on a cross and shed his blood for me. And if he never does another thing for me, I'm still going to serve him. You see, that's the problem with us. We come to God like he's some sugar daddy. We want him to fix everything. We want him to take care of this and bless us over there and bless us over here. And the first little thing that comes by, we fall apart. We backslide. We're out sin again. We're doing the same old, same old again. And they say, I can't believe it. She backslid so fast. She didn't backslide. She never was saved. And that's the kind of mentality that she had. Because when you get really, truly born again, you're a new creation. And you don't lose your walk with God is because somebody lied on you, somebody cussed you, somebody stole something from you. When you get really saved, you'll say, I'm not losing God for anybody, anything. He died for me, so I'm going to live for him. Somebody tell me what his name is. He's worth serving today, and you need to get it in your head. You're going to need to get it in your head, those places that God is wanting to take you, that there's going to be a process. You need to learn. I, I mean, I'm 38, and I'm going back to college, and I got a 95 on my psychology exam yesterday, Brother Bobby. I just thought I'd throw that in there for, I don't know why. But y'all know now how smart I am, right? <laughs> Amen. I'm trying to go, yes, my head is inflated, Brother Bobby. <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying to do stuff at 38 years old that, that you're supposed to be doing when you're 18 years old. But you know, I'm coming to the point now that I see that if, if God is going to take me to the next place, I've got to be willing to make some sacrifices. I've got to be willing to do now what I should have been doing 20 years ago. And so it is with every person in this house. Every person in this house has an ambition. There are ladies in this house that want to be a better mother, a better wife. There's men in this house that want to be a better father or a better husband, maybe a better grandpa. I and my children are done gone, you know, and they're now 20 and I've got 22 year old kids that's got grand, I've got little grandchildren bouncing on my knee and you say, you know, I messed up with my kids, I blew it with them, but I promise that I'm going to serve God in such a way that I can make an impact on my grandchildren. You see, we're, 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 everyone in this room has got ambition. Uh, some of you are trying to get a raise so that you can bring your children up out of poverty. There's other people in this house that are going through college and, and going through classes and going through school and you're saying I'm going to go to school so I can try to better myself and better my family. There's nothing wrong with all of that. But you're not going to wake up tomorrow morning with a doctrine in theology. You're not going to wake up tomorrow and be the mother that you're supposed to be. You're not going to wake up tomorrow and be the husband that you know you're supposed to be. It's got to be a process. You've got to get your mindset that I am going to go forward. Amen. I'm going to go forward and I'm going to do whatever I have to do to become that person that God has called me to be. I'm going to do whatever I have to do. I'm going to go through whatever I have to go through. I'm going to fight until my knuckles are bloody. I may have lost the last 30, but by God's grace, I will not lose the next. I may have lost the last two decades, but by the grace of God, I will not lose the next two decades. I may have lost the last 74 years, but I will not lose the last chapter of my life. I'm going to give God everything I have. My hair is falling out. My back is out of whack. I've got high blood pressure and diabetes. Maybe you've had a, a hysterectomy and you're young and you say, I wanted to have kids. Well, I'll tell you what you do. You set your eyes on somebody else's and say, 
I may not have no kids of my own, but I'm going to pull up little Susie. I'm going to pull up little Jimmy, and I'm going to be the best mother in Christ that I can be. You need to learn this, because as long as you got breath, there's work to do. And somebody in this house needs to shake themselves that things not getting done, that they're not doing anything. You can be rich. You can be my God. I feel like preaching. You can be rich. You can be poor. You can be intelligent. You can be not so much. You can have a Rockefeller last name, or you can be a lamb. But here is one absolute fact. We're all the same while we're sleeping. So you need to wake up. I'd rather have a woman that doesn't have as much gifting, but she's got unction. She's got tenacity. And she may not know how to do it all every time, but she's faithful. And she's there. And she's consistent. I'd much rather have her than a woman that can sing like a lark. A woman that's got money or got her intelligence, but she never shows up. Give it somebody to show up. We got men that can sing and preach and dance and this and that. But how, what does he do? He lays in bed till noon. Give me that man that may not be able to spell very well. He didn't have a GED. And he tried to go back to school, but they put him out. And he says, what am I going to do? You're going to do everything that God has called you to do. And you're going to do it with everything that's in you. Somebody shout amen. I love the word of God. It is so, it is so real, so powerful. It doesn't hold anything back. And, and I come across this morning the story of Elisha. Elisha and the story of Elijah. And particularly, I want to talk to you about Elisha. Elisha was a very powerful man of God. Very anointed, very awesome. And in so many ways, uh, in words, and only God could make a man this powerful. Extraordinary. Elijah was a man of the woods. He was a rough and rugged man. He hid in the wilderness like John the Baptist. And he, he wasn't a man of people. He wasn't, he, he wasn't a people person. He was a thunderous prophet who could pray fire down from the sky and pull a sword and slay 450 prophets and, and that's the kind of man Elijah was but Elisha was a little bit different he was the pastor extraordinaire he touched the people he talked to the people he was in amongst the people all the time Elijah used swords and fire Elisha used the word of God and, and the same anointing that was upon Elijah it was upon Elisha but in a different way Elijah and his time and his, his prophetic time, he, he witnessed about 14 different types of miracles. Elisha is going to witness about 28. All right, the man of God, Elijah, 14. Elisha is going to witness about 28. You see, I, I, I want to do something here because the Word of God gives us a beautiful picture in Elisha. And I, I, want, to, I want to fast forward to the end of Elisha's life. In fact, I want to go past. His, his life, and I want to go into his death. Elisha was so powerful. Elisha was so anointed that even after he had died and, and the flesh had rotted off his bones and, and there laid these old uh, bag of dry bones, they took a dead man, threw it into Elisha's tomb, and the body struck the old dry bones, and a man came back to life. I mean, Elisha was so, don't tell me that you're too old that God can't use you. Elisha was dead and still being used to you're not dead yet. Somebody shout amen. You're not too old. You're just too cold. You need to get on fire with Jesus and I promise you he'll find something for your old arthritic, powerful, wise self to do. God has a, has a purpose in your life today. Oh yeah, he's so powerful. Miracle number 28 takes place even after he's dead. And so I thought that I would start there and hit the rewind button and let's start going backwards. 28 28 miracles Elisha is going to see. He's an old man. He's an old man. Bearded face. Long, long bearded. Uh, uh, down to here. Gray, silver hair. Actually, he had no hair. It all fell out. It's even worse. You know how it is. Some men's hair turned gray. And some men's hair turned loose. I'm not going to tell you which one I'm in on. Now let's move on as I preach a little bit. 2 Kings 13, 21. We see the resurrection of a man touched by Elisha's bones. We back up two verses and he prophesies that Joash is going to smite Syria thrice but not consume it. We back up two more verses and he and I count prophecy a miracle because it suspends the natural laws of, of nature. You cannot know what's going to happen 
except it be by supernatural intervention. And so he prophesies in 17th verse that Joash is going to smite the Syrians in Aphek. And then in 2 Kings 9 uh, verse 7, we back up a few chapters and he, and he prophesies that Jehu is going to smite the house of Ahab. And then he prophesies of Hezael's cruelty to Israel in the 8th chapter. And we move back two verses and he prophesies of Benadad's untimely death. Then he prophesies in chapter 8 verse 1 of a seven year famine. And then we see in 2 Kings chapter 7 verse 6 that God is going to deceive the Syrians with the supernatural sound of chariots while Elisha was in the midst. And then he prophesies that the scoffing nobleman would see but not partake of the abundance that God was going to give them after the great famine. Which reminds me that in verse 1 he prophesied of a great famine. We back up to the, the previous chapter and he restores the sight of a Syrian army. We, we back up a little bit more and he smites the Syrian army with blindness. We back up just a little bit more and he has a supernatural vision of chariots all around him. And then he prophesies the Syrian battle plan. Two of them, the Syrians were going to come to war against him and Elisha was able to know exactly what they were going to do before they did it. And we back up a little bit more. The man of God walks up to the river and a lead or iron axe head and dropped down into the water and through the power of God the axe head raised up out of the water and floated on top of the water. He cursed Gehazi and leprosy came upon Gehazi. Now we're in chapter 5 and he perceives Gehazi's transgression. In, in, in 2 Kings chapter 5 I'm rewinding now very slowly he's, beginning, he's getting younger and younger Younger and younger, but now he's going to take Naaman into the water, and he's going to baptize him seven times, and he's he's going to come out, and he's going to be healed. As we we continue backing up, and we find the miracle of the bread, and in chapter four, verse forty-three. Then he heals the gourds in verse 41. Then he resurrects the Shunammite son in verse 34. And we back on up. And then he prophesies that the Shunammite woman is going to have a son who could not have one. We back on up a little bit more and we find the miracle of the vessels of oil. He makes it multiply. They kept pouring and kept pouring and kept pouring. And then we find that he deceives the Moabs by making it appear as if there's a valley of blood. And we back on up and Elisha's getting young and his beard is getting some color in it now and maybe some of the hair is growing back on his head and then he, he, he comes down and, and, and he's, still, he's still bald because these young boys are making fun of him and, and he curses them and two she bears jump out of the woods and, and kill them and just eat them up that was bad and then we, so we find we, we we're coming down now on, on, the, on the second miracle and he heals the water and then that brings us to his first miracle and that was the parting of the Jordan River. 28 of them. Bang, 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 bang over the course of many years. And now I see a man that has got a long resume. He's seen a lot. He's done a lot. God has used him in incredible ways. But he didn't start there. It started in a field. I love this. I believe God would like to speak to some people today. It didn't start with his bones in a tomb. It started with him with his hands on a plow. Twelve yoke of oxen. It started with nobody knowing who he was. No one knowing his name. No one knowing where he's from. It started with sweat running down his face and calluses on his hand and blood in his hands and, and plowing and he's faithful and he's working and he's laboring and nobody knows Elisha. He's not a young man. He's probably in his middle age at this time, but he's there and I don't know where the other men were at, but he's he's a breadwinner now and, and he's plowing in the field. And I like this because Elijah is on the run from Jezebel. He has just prayed the fire of God down and Jezebel. Jezebel said, I'm going to kill you. And so Elijah's on the run. He's on his way down to Shunem. And so now, as he's, as he's walking down the road, he looks over in the field and there's Elisha with his hands on the plow. And Elisha's plowing and Elijah's walking. Elisha's plowing and Elijah's walking. And 
something overshadows Elijah and Elijah takes his mantle off. I wish I had a mantle. He took his mantle off and he, he throws it over at Elisha. A mantle was like a, a cape of some sort. They would use it for warmth at night to lay down on. They use it for a lot of different reasons. And so now he takes his mantle off, which was symbolic of the prophetic calling that was upon his life. And Elijah throws the mantle upon Elisha. And Elisha is now in a predicament, Pastor Rusty. He's standing between the plow and the prophet. He's standing between all he's ever known and the unknown. He's standing between what he's come from and possibly where he could go. Elijah did not ask him to follow him. Elijah did not say, Elisha, God has called you. He just threw the mantle at him. And Elisha now has to make a choice. It's never going to be the same for the man of God. It's never going to be the same for him. He stands there. And what I wanted to tell you was, it pays off to be faithful in the field. A lot of people want to be the prophet, but he didn't call you in the temple. He called him in the field. You say, where do I go from here, pastor? I've got so many things that I need to do. I've got so many places that I need to go. I've got things that I need to accomplish. How do I do that? I'm telling you, stop looking so far ahead and look right where you're at now. The question is, what can I do now with the moment that I have? Put your hand on the plow and plow on, brother. Whatever you can do, wherever you're at right now, that is the thing that God has called you to do. I don't know what road brought you here. I don't know what you went through to get here. But what I do know is you are here. And you can't change the road you traveled. But you can certainly change the one that you're going to travel. I can change how I walk. I can change how I think. I know the road that I travel brought me pain. It brought me agony. I lost a lot of stuff. But in the name of Jesus, I will not continue walking this road. I'm here right now. I got my hand on the plow. It may not look glorious. It may not look glamorous. But I'm going to hold the plow, brother. I'm going to be the best that I can be wherever I am now. I'm going to plow the best that I can plow. Because God is watching me. And who knows when Elijah, oh my God help us, who knows when Elijah's going to walk by. Some of you are talking about being faithful as a pastor. I can't get you to be faithful as a member. You say, I'll be faithful if you let me work in the ministry. I can't get you faithful with your tithes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you say, I'd, I'd, like to, I'd like to run that ministry. You can't even run yourself yet. You say, you want to worry about this and you want to worry about that. And I come to tell somebody, get your hands on a plow that's right in front of you right now. I don't know what your giftings are. I don't know what your talents are. But most of you in this house know there's something that you can do. And stop worrying about what pastor's supposed to do. Pastor's going to do his part. If I don't, God's going to do with me. What you need to worry about is your field, your plow, and become faithful in that area. You may not be the smartest man in the room. You may not be the wisest man. You may not have much resources. But what I am telling you, sisters and brothers, take the resources you have and do what you got with what you have. I may not have everything, but I have some things, and I'm going to use what I got to get what I need. God's not waiting for someone that's drinking sweet tea and sleeping all day. He's wanting somebody that's up in the morning and got their hands on the block. Is there anybody in this house that'll shake themselves and say it may not look the best tonight? I might be sweaty and my clothes may be torn, but I'm going to give it everything that I got. I'm going to give it everything that's inside of me. It's like Brother Scott Smith said, I'm going to stick my foot in it. I'm going to give it everything I have. And I'm going to tell you why it's so important for you to be on, on, on your toes. Because the Bible plainly states that Elijah passed him by. 1 Kings 19, 19 through 21. Elijah just threw the mantle, but he kept walking. He threw the mantle, but he kept walking. He didn't turn around to see what he would do with it. He just kept walking. 
Elisha standing between the prophet who is walking and the plow who is sitting. This is a, a, a very rough place. This is a difficult place because the door has now opened for him. And I want to remind you again that Elijah did not ask Elijah to come, but now he holds the mantle and he knows that there's a door open. You've got to be ready. You've got to be ready. I know people who could have got jobs if they just knew how to fill out a resume, but they didn't know how to fill out a resume. And so they filled out stuff that was just nonsense. The employer looked at their resume. They could have done a better job than half the people in that place, but because they had not prepared themselves, they did not get the job. I've seen doors open for men that if they had been prepared, they could have walked through it. If they had just been awake when the phone rang, they would have had employment. But instead, they slept. I've met ladies that had doors of opportunity open, but they were not ready. I'm telling you that you've got to be ready. When the Paul says, is there any volunteers, throw up both hands and say, then what do you want me to do? Get in there and work and do it with a sweet spirit. The spirit Spirit of Christ upon you and let God's favor rule your life. You see, two men with the same exact qualifications can walk up to a door, and both men are, I mean, one man maybe not even as qualified, but he's got the favor of God on him. I've seen it a thousand times for less qualified men find the job because God turned the hearts of an employer. But you know what? He always found the man that was at the door saying, I'm ready to walk in. Are you at the door? Which door, Pastor? The door that you're at right now. I don't care where you came from. If you live on this property, if you live out there, there's going to be a door open for you, and you need to be ready to walk through it. If I live at 129 Big Hill Avenue or at the Crystal Cathedral, I'm ready. I'm going to make the best of what I got. It may just be a little bit. I may just be making a minimum wage. I may have a one I 
pallets from here to there. And people say, what's wrong, Pastor? I couldn't explain it to them. I was working in a factory when I was supposed to be walking the streets of Richmond. I was working on a forklift when I was supposed to be dealing with men's souls. It was what I was supposed to do at that time. I was supposed to drive a forklift. I had to support my wife and family. But I'd already seen the manna. And I didn't sleep well. I couldn't eat right. And I wasn't happy. Because there was something deeper that I had to do. The plow. What he knows. And the mantle that he does not know. Now I'm going to tell you what Elisha does. He goes home and he breaks the plow into pieces. He uses the plow for kindling. But Tom, I got more of your handkerchiefs than I do mine now. And I'm just going by faith that there's no gifts inside there. See, I'm not supposed to say stuff like that while I'm preaching. Just learn from me, brothers, okay? Learn. I want you to watch what he does. He takes the plow, he breaks it into pieces, and he builds a fire, and then he goes and kills the cow. The old famous sermon has been preached thousands of times. You burn the plow and you kill the cow. Why? Why is that important? Why is that symbolic? Because he stands between the plow and the mantle. The plow and the mantle, everything that was and everything that shall be. He stands in between both worlds. And so the burning of the plow and the killing of the cow symbolizes no return. It's the burning of bridges. It's once I do this, once I walk away from this, I'm never going back. You see, that's some of y'all's problem. You want the mantle. You want the grace of God. You want to serve God. But you can't get rid of him. You can't get rid of the old plow. And so you're trying to serve God, but you won't let go of all those relationships. Some of you like having the attention of these Jake legs. But also you're going to find yourself void of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. 